Okay, thank you for coming. The handout that I'll be demonstrating from or talking from today is available online now at um, streaminglearningcenter.com. So if you go to the home page, which is streaminglearningcenter.com, and you go to producing and deploying HEVC, you'll be able to download both the handout and some of the sample files I'll be showing you. So the files that I've encoded that I'm going to reach some quality related comparisons about, um, they're available on this site as well, so you can download those. Okay, so this is the session on producing and deploying HEVC. And here's our agenda. So we're going to talk, you know, what HEVC is very quickly, um, talk about the royalty status, which is relatively new, compare quality to H.264, um, talk about the status of encoding and decoding tools, and then we'll take a, a look at my guesses for where HEVC is going to show up or continue to show up in the OTT and streaming marketplaces. Let me show you real quickly the, the, um, the document that I'm going to focus on is going to end right around here. And if you go beyond that in the document that you download, you'll be able to see still frame comparisons that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on in the discussion for reasons that will be clear in the discussion. But if you go beyond that in the handout, You'll be able to see 720p comparisons between ATBC and H.264. Um, in a, a number of places in my demo files, and also at 1080p. So you'll be able to see side-by-side -side comparisons. The reason I'm not going to go through those is because where, where HEVC does very well compared to H.264 in static quality, where, where an image-by-image -image comparison works, I'm finding that HEVC has some motion-related artifacts that only show up during real-time playback that kind of make these comparisons and any comparisons based on <coughs> signal-to-noise or SSIM or any kind of objective still-frame metric a little bit less valuable than sometimes they are in other areas. So. I'm going to show you where on my demo files to look. I don't know if it'll show up here. I'll try and see if you guys can see it here. But the reason I'm not going to spend a lot of time comparing still frame versus still frames, I think you know, that's all great. But if you see a lot of mosquitoes in the video when it's playing in real time, you don't really care about still frame quality. So. But anyway, all that's there if you want to take a look at it down the road. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the early stuff pretty quickly because I think everybody knows this. Um, HEVC is the successor to H.264. In January of 2013, it was cleared for first stage approval. That means we can start selling it and using it. Uh, the key benefit is the same quality as H.264 at between 35 to 50% data rate reduction. Um, that lets you reduce bandwidth costs. That lets you send. HD videos through smaller pipes than you could before, or send more videos through existing pipes. All of those are good things. Um, the other high-level benefit of, of, uh, of HEVC is going to be the ability to produce efficiently ultra-high-definition videos. And there are technical links at the end of the article that talk, you know, if you want deeper depths into, you know, what is HEVC, what type of algorithms is it used, that kind of stuff. There are links at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the uh, presentation. OK, so anybody who's ever looked at H.264 has seen this page in Wikipedia. Um, you know, we've got different profiles in HEVC, just like H.264. The different profiles use different compression algorithms and techniques. These are the different compression algorithms and techniques. These are the different profiles. 
What's interesting about HEVC is that where, in my analysis, I haven't seen a lot of difference in H.264 between, say, the quality produced by the high profile versus the, the baseline profile. In H.264, there are very significant differences between the quality that you get in the main and the main 10. So main is an 8-bit codec, and main 10 is a 10-bit codec, which gives you much better color representations. So one of the first things you want to check if you're going to buy an H.2 or H HEVC or H.265 encoder is, is it 8-bit or 10-bit? And I think all the initial ones were 8-bit, now they're moving more towards 10-bit, but that's something you want to check. Similarly, if you're buying a HEVC decoder, you want to understand, is this going to decode 8-bit or 10-bit, because obviously if it's 8-bit, as soon as 10-bit content comes, you won't be able to play it. So if you're buying a UHD television set today, that's one of the facts that you really want to get your arms around. It's also one of the facts that none of the TV companies tell you. So good luck with that. <laughs> you know, I tried, I tried looking at a bunch of specs on, you know, some of these commercial TVs, and shockingly, none of them talked about 8-bit versus 10-bit. It was all, and they didn't even talk about HEVC. They just said, yeah, it's 4K content. So I'm not, <laughs> okay, enough about that. Um, okay, and, and this is from an elemental white paper. Um, the bit.ly URL is here, not something I really want to go into, but if you want to look at, at a high level how HEVC compares technically to MPEG-2 and to H.264, you know, there's a lot of similarities, there's a lot of differences, and this, this table really seems to summarize it pretty, pretty efficiently. So that's there if you want to look at it. Okay, on the royalty status, um, couple of things. Number one, MPEG LA came out with kind of a projection of what they think the royalty will be uh, in January. And this is a framework, right? This is not the final royalty. They don't have, they don't have a final royalty group. Um, for people who don't know, MPEG LA, they try and get all the patent holders into a group and say, let's present one royalty so that if ESPN wants to license HEBC, they only have to write one check every year. You know, it simplifies everything for everybody. That's what MPEG, MPEG LA does. So what they said in January was, we don't have everybody in the group, so you know, we can tell you what we think we're going to charge, but we don't have everybody who has HEBC intellectual property rights in our group, so we can tell you what we're going to charge, but we can't tell you if they're going to charge you, what they're going to charge you, how many checks you're going to have to write. Um, the framework that MPEG LA presented was 20 cents per encoder decoder. Um, no royalty for either encode or decode until you ship in excess of 100,000, which is a <laughs> big relief for a lot of people. Um, and then on the negative side, there's a $25 million annual maximum. So in comparison, H.264 had a maximum this year of 6.5 million. So if Adobe decides to put H.264 in Flash, as they did a few years ago, back then they were paying $5 million. If they make the same decision today, they're going to pay $25 million. And as we'll talk about, their quarterly revenue last year, or last quarter, was $48 million. So basically, if they decide to put HEBC in Flash, they're going to cut their gross income by 50%. So good luck with that conversation with the C CFO. Um, anyway, I mean, it, it was a... I don't like this structure. You know, Elemental is selling $26,000 encoders. You know, God bless them. They're not going to sell 100,000 of them. They're not going to pay a cent in HEBC royalties. Um, whereas Adobe, if they want to disseminate HEBC decode, which is you know, what we all want, they're going to have to pay $25 million for a product they're not charging for. So it really, it really you know, they want simplicity, and, and obviously that's a really good goal, but you'd want them to kind of match expense versus revenue, which is this, this isn't doing. And you'd also like them somehow to encourage HEBC decode. There will be no HEBC content royalty, um, even for pay-per-view subscription, whereas with H.264 there is a royalty for pay-per-view uh, and subscription over certain minimums. But, um, you know, I, I don't think this royalty structure does a lot to promote general purpose HEVC usage. For example, Adobe is putting HEVC decode in prime time, which is their premium deployment platform, but they're not putting it in Flash Player. 
Why? Because they can charge for prime time. And, so, and, and that's, you know, Flash has kind of transitioned from this really strategic jewel, this, this um, very important piece of their product portfolio that differentiated them from a lot of companies. You know, that was in, in 2005, 2006, and today it's, it's a cash cow. How do we make money from this thing? You know, we <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking the product manager for Flash probably sits in the basement somewhere because they never talk about it. It's, you know, it, it's not a really strategic product for them anymore. So they're not investing in it. They're not giving it away for free. That's their right. I'm not being critical. It's more observational. But I don't see HEVC decode and flash anytime, you know, in the near future, if, if ever at all. And then be, besides that, what we don't know is um, what Microsoft's going to do, what Panasonic's going to do, what Dolby's going to do, what Samsung's going to do. There's a very good article in Computer World. Uh, and there's the, uh, it's not Computer World, I'm forgetting the magazine it's in, but you, you check the Bitly link down there and you'll see an article that describes everybody who is not in the current MPEG LA patent pool. So you're going to pay something to MPEG LA and there's a, an additional group of unknowns that you may end up, or you probably will end up paying as well. Okay, and I kind of ranted on some of this stuff uh, a few moments ago. On the encoder side, you know, I, other than Adobe, um, maybe Microsoft, Apple, I don't see a lot of encoder companies, you know, hitting this $100,000 maximum. So I don't think it's going to affect the encoding side at all. On the decoder, there's a lot of companies that will be hit by this, a lot of the companies shipping inexpensive chips, all the browser vendors if they decide to put HEVC decode, Flash if they decide, QuickTime, same thing. Um, but the hardware decoders, they can offset the cost. I mean, it's, it's another component of doing business. Software decoders, particularly the free software decoders, obviously they have a, a problem somehow offsetting that cost. So I, I kind of talked about the, the Adobe story. Um, you know, Google, I'm thinking they're pushing VP9. I don't see them licensing HEBC until they're forced to. Microsoft, they probably will but there's no time frame set. Obviously, their net income is much, much higher, and $25 million is a, a much smaller percentage of their net income on any particular quarter or year. And we'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Okay, so the evolution of my impressions of, um, of the comparative quality of HEVC versus H.264 is when I looked at it really quickly before streaming Media West, I had about a, a day or two to look at side-by-side -side comparisons. I focused primarily on still frame comparisons and I was pretty impressed. At 720p, I saw similar quality at a 40% reduction in file size, and at 1080p, HEVC was side-by-side -side comparison still frame hitting the 50% target. You know, same quality at 50% of the data rate. And then from December till now, you know, it's still true for still image comparisons, but moving playback shows a lot more mosquito artifacts hovering around the sharp edges of panning type um, motion. So this is the HEVC test clip at 450 kilobits per second, um, 720p file. So when I do my 720p comparisons in H.264, I always encode it 800 kilobits per second because that's a nice data rate for really differentiating some of the encoding tools and some of the codecs. And we're going to go, we've got a gentleman playing the piano, and then we're going to go to a banjo player, and then we're going to go to a ballerina. And when the banjo player is kind of doing what he does, if you, and I don't know what you're going to see on this screen. Again, you can download the files and look, at, you know, look for yourself. The reason I'm showing you here is so you'll know where to look when you actually look at the files. So if you look at the, you see the areas that are kind of going with them? That's what I mean when I say mosquitoes. And here's our ballerina, and you see the same kind of things following her around. So, so what we're seeing is we're seeing, again, this is, this is very discrete types of scenes. You know, in a talking head that's not moving, the 50% quality, excuse me, the, the same quality of 50% of the data rate is very accurate. But in some sequences, I'm seeing those kind of motion artifacts. I encoded this particular file 
at both um, 450, which was a little bit, little bit more than 50% the data rate, and 600 kilobits per second. And at the 600 kilobit per second file, which is three quarters the data rate of the, um, of the H.264 file, you still saw some of those, uh, some of those uh, motion artifacts. So again, if you download the files that are available on my website, you know, around 41 seconds in, you can duplicate what you just saw. And then around 47 seconds in, if you, if you focus on the ballerina, you'll be able to see that as well. So I think there's some consistency here, right? You've got a soft background. You've got very sharp person in the foreground. You've got some lateral motion. I mean, that's, that, there's a lot of clips like that. So, and, and let me say that these are standard test clips that I've used for you know, probably five years at this point. I encoded with multiple HEBC encoders, and I saw this type of artifact in every encoder. So it's not, it's not an encoder-specific type problem. I think it's a technology-specific problem. So, and there's, and for people who, who might have come in late, these clips are available on my website, Streaming Learning Center. Right now it's the top article in recent articles. You click that and you can get both all the files that I'm referring to and you can download the handout. Excuse me, were those files live or file based? Say it again? Were they live or file They're file based. Okay, so, so what's interesting is that you know, all the vendors are, are looking at PSNR tests, and PSNR tests are very valid, but they don't test motion, they test still frames. So you know, I'm gonna, every time I see any vendor's comparison, I'm gonna look at the numbers, and I'm gonna look at the, the, the frame comparisons, but it's like play it for me live, and then look and see the types of videos that they have, and then you can do your comparisons. So again, this is Telestream. This is from a Telestream white paper. Um, and what they did here is they, they did the average PSNR, the uh, signal to noise ratio per bit rate. And they did two different, they did a, a CBR and a high quality you know, VBR representation of both H.264 and um, H.265. And here's MPEG-2 CBR. And then at this data rate, you know, why do I test my 720p files at 800 kilobits per second when nobody encodes at 800 kilobits per second because as this chart shows, everybody looks good if the data rate's high enough. Really, you have to push the data rate down here to start seeing differentiation between the codecs. And what we're seeing is MPEG-2 drops off first, H.264 drops off second, and HEVC retains high quality much further at, at lower data rates. So this is, this is what Telstream is finding. And this is... This is a, a numerical representation of some of those findings. And basically what they found, so this is Telstream, and this is still frame. You know, this is uh, PSNR-based testing. And what they found was, as compared to MPEG-2, H.264, and, and, and here's HEBC, between these two, there was a 28.6% difference in a sports-oriented uh, type content. And then down here, where they only looked at H.264 and H.265, there was a 28% difference in terms of quality. So the whole 50% reduction in data rate at similar quality is not consistent with what Telstream found in their white paper. Um, I spoke to other companies. I spoke to Harmonic and Elemental. Um, what I'm hearing is that, you know, what, what they're saying is same quality at 45%, Elemental was same quality at 40%. It's a moving target because you can, you know, you can, you can encode HEVC at, you know, five minutes a frame. Um, and you get better quality, but that's not commercially reasonable, right? No customer can wait that long. So what they're trying to come up with is, you know, what's acceptable from an encoding time versus quality perspective. And that's why these numbers are moving targets. And I think it's going to be moving target for a while because codecs, people get better at encoding um, as they get more familiar with the codec. So I expect to see pretty significant improvements in quality over the next two or three years. Um, but right now, this is what they're quoting. And again, everybody's citing PSNR and SSIM. They're not, you know, they're, they're not, it, it, it's very hard to do side-by-side -side comparisons when, when there's video playing because you've really, you know, it, it, it's just much harder. There's no metric that really covers that. So my take is HEVC is certainly a better codec. It's, it's evolving quickly and re improve over time. 
But really, you know, I find that PSNR and similar tests that, re that rely on still frame quality are kind of limited in their application because, you know, you don't watch video to look at still frames, you look at video to see motion, and if that type of artifact keeps coming up, then it's not going to deliver the benefits that, that uh, it's advertised on. So that's the whole quality side. And now, you know, where will, so even 25%, I mean, I'm sure if ESPN or CNN or some of these big websites could cut their bandwidth costs by 25%, I mean, I think that would be a huge deal for them. So I'm not denigrating a 25% uh, re reduction in bandwidth, but it's, it's not 50% yet. So the second question is, okay, well, that's what the quality is. Now, now where will it play? And I ran these tests, obviously, on low-end machines in my office. You know, I've got a 48-core HP Z820 workstation, and HEBC plays just fine on that. But, you know, there's not that many of them out there. So this is um, the oldest Core 2 Duo computer in my office. I think it's from 2004. This is a circa 2009 MacBook Pro. And this is an HP EliteBook. This is the computer I have up here that's a 4 four core, eight cores with HTT technology. And what I did was I tested CPU utilization with H.264 and 720p, HEVC 720p, and then H.264 1080p and HEVC 1080p. So, and I just wanted to see, you know, how effectively can these low-end computers play these configured, uh, or these file configurations. And it turned out in the 720p category, um, all the computers could play H.264, no surprise there, but they could also play HEVC pretty comfortably. So I would feel pretty comfortable saying, you know, if you wanted to deploy HEVC, probably any computer you would still find relevant could probably play it pretty easily. So most of these computers would be doing the H.264 in hardware, right? Good point, yeah. No, 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 these are, these are, you know, I think that's a great point. So, and these, these numbers were impressive um, until you got to 1080p, and then it all kind of fell apart. But, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in 1080p streaming video anyway, but, but, um, but on the, for H.264, the 1080p video played fine. HEVC, you know, it failed on the two dual-core computers. So, if you wanted to deploy HEVC, you have some idea who the viewers are, what kind of computers they're running. In this, in this, uh, under these tests, again, if, if you care about computers in the, in the dual core configuration, 1080p is not a good, um, is not a good configuration. Of course, HEVC will be available for adaptive streaming. In an instance like this, the decoder would say, hey, I'm dropping frames here. Let's not go to the higher quality stream. So this is not, you know, this is, not saying HEVC won't work on these computers, it's, it's, you know, 1080p won't play. And if you're sending a single stream, you know, 1080p is in a good configuration. And then this is, you know, kind of to your point, this is, this is the CPU utilization for H.264 on this i7 based notebook, you know, hovering just below 20%, and here's HEVC hovering just over 21%. So again, HEVC can get pretty, and this is all VLC player. So, okay, moving into the mobile space, this is, um, this is some research published by Intel. Here's the bit.ly link. You can, uh, you can look it up yourself. What's the frame rate on optimized code um, for 1080p video? You know, they're getting 29.6 frames per second on their, their, um, on their Atom processor. And, Probably more to the point, we'll, we'll look at a, a battery power utilization uh, in a few moments. But if we, you know, how many systems out there will be able to decode HEBC? These are some, sys, uh, some statistics or some projections from Frost and Sullivan, and they're dividing it up between uh, all of the devices. I think everybody assumes that all computers sold in the last two years and all computers going forward will be able to play HEBC in software. And this is, these are the projections for, um, for the number of devices that can play that are not, not computers. Um, you know, we're seeing current 
tablets like the iPad or you know, a lot of the Android tablets are HEVC, HEVC capable via software only. More importantly, we're seeing a lot of chips coming out with HEVC, HEVC hardware decode, and more of those will be coming. I think on the software side, at least for the tablet space, we're seeing, we're seeing big issues in terms of battery life. So, you know, it's one thing to play the video, but what do people see in terms of um, reduction in battery life? And this is a really good article written in TechSpot, and here's the bit.ly link to that article, where they compared the battery life for H.264 at 1080p and HEVC at 1080p, and they found that you were using so much more CPU utilization that you basically cut viewing time in half. So that's a consideration. You know, you're going to save money on the bandwidth that you're delivering the video to the viewer. Um, you're going to allow them to pack more video on their devices, but the negative is going to be they're only going to be play half as long on batteries. Okay, so the three, you know, the obvious three markets are streaming to computers, mobile, and OTT, and of course any, any OTT box, you'll be able to customize the streams for that, and that'll probably play, you know, everything up to 4K without any problem. They'll always be plugged in, so that shouldn't be an issue from a battery perspective. Okay, so what about producing and decoding? Um, pretty much every vendor I've spoken to is either announced or is close to shipping. HEVC encoding, companies like Elemental, ATEM, and NEC are currently shipping live 4K P60 10-bit encodes. So you can do live um, HEVC encoding with, with these boxes. I think more is coming from a number of different vendors. And pretty much all of the, I don't want to say all, I don't, I don't think Sorensen has announced a solution, but I just saw an announcement from Telestream with a lot of their products. I think every vendor is being responsive to this. And really, it doesn't cost them anything, right? I mean, none of these vendors are going to be shipping in over 100,000 unit qualities. And even if they were, it was 20 cents a unit. So you know, from a royalty perspective, there's no reason for them not to include HEVC encode in their products. What kind of encoding time differential would you expect to see? Um, I ran some tests on, and actually, it's, it's, uh, it's not Rovi Total Code anymore. I meant to change that. Um, it's now main concept. Total code, they're, they're a separate company from Rovi. There was a, a management buyout kind of thing. So Rovi no longer owns main concept. But if you look at the at a 720p file, 3.5 megabits per second, in their encoding tool, it was around 7, 749 to encode to HEVC, and it was 139 to encode to H.264. If you go up to 1080p at 4 megabits per second, it was 35 minutes for HEVC. Uh, just under three minutes for H.264, so there's a 13-time increase in coding time. Now, this tool is not wonderfully um, optimized for multi-processor encoding. You know, if you look at the CPU utilization when they're encoding the HEBC, it really doesn't increase that much. So it's a 48-core machine. They're probably using 10% or 15%. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement in this tool, and I think there's a lot of tools out there that can that kind of do better because they're more... Uh, multiprocessor aware. I spoke to people at ATEM. They said they're targeting three to four times increasing encoding times um, with their encoders. That's where they think a sweet spot is. That's where they think their customers will find that acceptable. And Elemental is saying that the HEVC encode is either two to four times slower for video on demand files or live will require two to four times more resources to, to achieve the same configuration as H.264. So whatever you're looking at, you know, it could be as much as 13x if, if the product isn't wonderfully multiprocessor aware. And most of the high-end companies are looking between two and four times the encoding time or two and four times resources necessary to produce the same file in a live environment. And then, you know, what's it going to look like? What are the, what are the encoding parameters look like in the different tools? Obviously, that's going to that's gonna vary by vendor and product. So Rovi gives you direct access to a bunch of the very specific H.265 encoding tools. Some of the things we saw on that initial Wikipedia chart, the, the encoding tools over here. So you've got 
coding tree unit configuration, sample adaptive offset, wavefront parallel processing. And the only thing, you know, it's always nice to have more configuration options, but the problem is finding a use case for those options. You know, when do you, when do you turn this dial? When do you turn this knob? And I've never really seen a, either an H.264 encoding tool or even, an, you know, obviously not an H.265 encoding tool that explain that, you know. So it's, you know, another approach to this problem is taken by Elemental, and Elemental says, you know, forget all that stuff. We're not going to give you access to it. We're going to create a profile that you get very, very limited control over, and we're going to make, it, we're going to make the best decision for you. We're going to give you a, a density versus quality slider kind of trade-off, and that's all we're going to give you. And Elemental was very successful with that with H.264. Their tool produced excellent H.264 quality, even though the, the available tweaks were very minimal. So I think it's, in some ways it's a better approach because 99% of us don't know how to use stuff like this anyway. So, and this is Harmonic, this is Promedia Express, and they take kind of the elemental approach in this tool where you really, you really have very little control over the specific HEVC parameters. Um, they have a tool called Promedia Carbon. Carbon coder is traditionally given access to pretty much every configuration option that's available for that codec, and they plan on doing that for HEVC as well. So depending on the vendor, so how, how much tougher is your job going to be if you start encoding HEVC next week? You know, not that hard at all. You know, a lot of the concepts are going to be very similar. The whole GOP structure, you're still using, you know, uh, I, B, P frames. You're still using, key, you know, keyframe intervals. You're using profiles, levels, search parameters. So a lot of that's going to look the same as what you're doing with H.264. And I think most of the encoding vendors are not going to give you really direct access to the HEVC specific algorithms in most instances anyway. So I don't, encoding HEVC is going to be pretty simple, long story short. What about the software side? Um, you know, how do you play HEVC once you produce the files? Um, you know, DivX 10 with HEVC decode shipped in September 2013, um, and VLC player with HEVC shipped in November 2013. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with, um, with DivX. Um, when they initially did this, they're, they were un unclear about the royalty picture. So, you know, they just kind of went for it. Kudos to them. But, if, you know, if they ship 10 million copies, that ends up being, you know, $2 million. They're now a very much smaller company they were than when they were owned by Rovi. I don't know if, I don't know if they continue with that policy. I don't know if they don't, but, you know. In comparison, VLC, they're a French company, and they say, hey, software patents are invalid. We're not going to pay anything. And that's what they said for H.264, and MPEG LA never went after them. So, you know, they're taking the same, you know, does MPEG LA ever go after them in France to, to make them stop? I don't know. But certainly they would go after Rovi if they took the same, or main concept, if they took the same stance in the U.S. And then in terms of the other, you know, usual suspects, we covered the flash story. Adobe has said they will include HEVC decode in prime time, which costs money, um, but not in the flash player. So this was an announcement they made at, at NAB. No word from Apple. <laughs> I heard there were some job descriptions floating around for, you know, hiring programmers familiar with HEVC, you know, but that's, you know, they're looking at it, but there's no announcement. Um, Google, again, they've been pushing VP9. Microsoft, no word, but I would expect them to, I would expect both of those companies to license it in the next, um, next year or two. The problem, if, if Google and Microsoft license it, you, you know, you still have Safari to worry about, you still have Opera to worry about. So you're, you know, how do you get to 99% of the market, which is what Flash gives us, and which is kind of what we need to, to feel comfortable shipping a codec that can be decoded everywhere. And then I kind of went through this uh, at the start. So I don't see Adobe. You know, in January when I looked at this, I said, well, sure, Adobe will include HEVC decode and Flash sometime really soon. And then I was reading, <laughs> I was reading in The Economist about the effect that their creative cloud offering, they went from a, a product to a, to a subscription, and their, their gross profits went from uh, 200 million, or the net income per quarter went from 200 million to 48 million. 
because they're no longer getting product sales, they're getting these, this periodic revenue. Now the stock market loves it, their, their stock price has doubled, but when you look at the 48 million number for net income in first quarter of 2014, and you look at the 25 million number, you just, you just know that's never going to happen. So I just don't see Adobe including Flash and free Flash player. And as I said, they've announced uh, inclusion in, in prime time, not in Flash. So, you know, Google, Microsoft, and Apple, they can, you know, they can hide 25 million a lot easier, and they have some product that, that actually uh, get, they get revenue for that they can offset against the expense. But in terms of pervasive free decode, I just don't see that happening in the short term. What does that mean? Um, it's going to be interesting, because if I'm, you know, again, if I'm paying millions a month in bandwidth charges, and I can cut that by 25%, you know, I'll spend 20 cents a user. Um, so I see the sites at the top of the pyramid saying, well, sure, let's do this. You know, I'll pay the decode, and then I'll just kind of save money on, on, on the bandwidth side. And I know, you know, I don't know if, of anyone doing this yet, but this, is, this makes sense where, you know, it doesn't make sense for Adobe to, to, uh, to include it in Flash or... And that's the only way it's going to be pervasive, like, next week. I mean, if, if Adobe put HEBC decode, and the reason I keep going back to them is if they put decode and flash next week, we could ship HEBC next week. But there's literally no other company with that penetration that gives us that capability. And again, I just don't see it happening for the reasons I've talked about. So, you know, I think these companies up here make, may make a, a very cost-oriented decision. They're building their own players. They can include HEVC decode by licensing from a number of companies, and they can just pay the royalty directly. And the rest of us down here, and you know, some of you are probably up here, but you know, I'm certainly down here. I just either, either my bandwidth cost is so small that I don't really care about it, um, or you know, we, I spoke to a guy from Harvard yesterday. If he's, you know, he doesn't have 100,000 viewers on his website, right? He's got, so if, if, if a smaller company or a company, uh, you know, even, any company with 50,000 employees, if they want to use HEBC internally, they can do that, and they wouldn't end up paying a royalty because they're under the, the 100,000 minimum. So I think a lot of people will start considering using HEBC internally uh, or even externally, but, but dealing with the royalty issue directly rather than, than hoping Adobe will, will, uh, will come around. You know, how much problems will the royalties be on the competitive side? You know, VP9, they made a really big, uh, really big stink around CES in January. You know, all of a sudden, HEVC was dead, and, you know, VP9 was going to take over the world. And that was all TV vendors trying to sell 4K TVs, and then you really haven't heard much about VP9 since then. I don't, I don't you know, if you're, if you're a standard-based market, whether it's, you know, uh, OTT or television sets, you're going to go with the standard. You may support... VP9, but you're not going to support VP9 to the exclusion of HEVC. So how do I see this playing out? I don't know broadcast. I'm not. I'm not going to look at that. You know, let's take a look at streaming and um, and OTT. You know, I'm not a big believer. OTT, I think, is going to be driven by UHD. You know, Netflix famously has started using um, HEVC for House of Cards. But the, the projections for UHD television sets is very, very small. If you're Netflix, it's very strategic to be serving that market. You know, 99% of the other websites don't care so much. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're, if you're selling in aggressively in the OTT marketplace, this, this is something you have to look at. If you're not, then I'm not sure how quickly it's going to become important. The um, couple of caveats on the, on the UHD TV set, you know, there, there's a couple things going on in that space. One is the 8-bit versus 10-bit um, that I talked about at the start. You know, we're seeing most of the original HEVC encoders were main 8-bit encoders. Now they're all moving to main 10. Hollywood's going to want to start pushing out that content, and it may not play on some of the earlier um, HEVC television sets or set-top boxes. This is going to take longer to coalesce. There was the, there's different color space definitions required for different television sets. And REC 2020 
was developed for UHD sets, but none of the screens that were necessary to implement that were available during the first generation of UHD TV sets. So all of the UHD TV sets today use the REC 29 or the 8-bit color space, even though REC 2020 is what's specified for UHD. Really, bottom line is at some point, UHD is going to shift over from 8-bit to 10-bit, and 10-bit content is not going to play that effectively on an 8-bit display. Whether that's next year or 10 years, I wasn't able to get my arms around. Some people are saying it's going to be five or six years. Some people are saying it's going to be you know, a lot sooner. But either way, I think that's a, that's a major trend in how HEVC will be deployed in the OTT and broadcast spaces. And long story short, if I'm, you know, if I'm buying a uh, $25,000 UHD set, I want to know, you know, is the display 8-bit or 10-bit? I'm sure right now they're all 8-bit. Um, is the HEVC decoder main 10 or main? And then is the HDMI connector connector 2.0 specification or I think 1.4 specification. So you know you can live if your HEVC decoder doesn't decode the latest technology because you can just connect via HDMI to a set-top box. You can get around your own internal. The problem is for, um, for 4K 60P, you need the HDMI 2.0 spec. So if you're going to buy a UHD set, if you're going to do it in the next one or two years, it's probably not going to be 10-bit compatible. Don't know how soon that will become relevant, you know, you should make sure it's main 10, not main, but most importantly, you should make sure it's HDMI 2.0 or upgradable to HDMI 2.0 because that will really determine whether a set-top box sitting in front of you can play back UHD at 60p. Really, really interesting, you know, so we looked at the encode quality, we looked at the encoding, we looked at the, um, the decode capability, you know, what about deliverability? And this was really kind of an interesting, <laughs> so this is a chart from the Wall Street Journal. So UHD, Netflix is shipping at um, 15 megabits per second. So that's what you need to play this stuff. And this is the average throughput for Netflix in Time Warner Cable, Verizon, AT&T, Uverse, and Comcast. So this is 2.5 megabits per second going down to 1.5 megabits per second. And I don't know how many people have heard about this, this whole issue, but basically the cable companies were saying, we're spending way too much money delivering Netflix content, so we're going we're gonna to deprioritize their content. Thus, you see a significant drop in effective throughput for Netflix. And then Netflix said, well, we'll just pay you these peering charges. And all of a sudden, the bandwidth increased again. So Netflix is having to pay all of the major ISPs to achieve deliverability of their content. So look at these numbers. You know, the number you're not seeing on the page, or here it is, 15 megabits per second for UHD. Who can get that? And, and who can actually push it through the networks in a big way? And that, I think, is going to be a very significant. Um, and a lot of people are, are talking, you know, so Netflix can afford to pay. But if you're a smaller company, um, you're just not going to be able to push the bits through to your viewers in any kind of reasonable time frame. So this is a, this is a huge issue in terms of deliverability. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, Netflix is saying, hey, why should we have to pay you a thing? I mean, Jan Ozer, he's spending 80 bucks a month to get 25 megabits per second download. He's paying you that money, you know, just deliver the 15 megabits to him. And they're saying, well, you know, we're having to spend too much to upgrade our infrastructure just for your content. And, you know, I don't know who's right, but that's, that's the dynamic that's taking place. So, summary on OTT, there are services launching worldwide in 2014. Um, it feels like there's too few sets out there, and, and there's a lot of other issues to, um, to really have this be a significantly impactful um, codec within, within the short-term time frame. It's, you know, this is my kind of high-level, um, you know, my high-level analysis in that space. And in terms of, you know, premium content, you know, I think in the streaming space, you know, you don't need to, you don't need 15 megabits per second for, for, for 4K. You know, if you can save 25% on bandwidth costs, that's worth going after. 
And I think you know, if you've got monetizable video where you've got significant enough bandwidth savings, I think you may see people going after ATVC in the, in the relative short term. You know, if, 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 I don't know why ESPN wouldn't, right, or CNN, or you know, if they're paying a million a month in bandwidth costs, why wouldn't they try and reduce it um, uh, and by getting their own license or by using Adobe Prime Time or any of these other premium services that can deliver ATVC for them? General content for, for us in the great unwashed, I see it years away for free decode. Um, although, you know, somebody like Harvard could, could implement HEVC tomorrow because they're under the 100,000 user minimum. So if you're, if you're, if you've got a very well-defined fixed viewing group that's under 100,000, you can implement HEVC tomorrow without paying any royalty at all. Here's the resources I talked about with, uh, with bit.ly links. And we've got time for a couple of questions. Say it again. I was interested in your comments about 1080p and what you feel about it because um, sure I can see it's a marginal case for streaming PCs but a lot of what people are picking up on is reducing uh, CDN and transport costs for HD catch up content and 1080p makes a lot of sense for the smart TV apps. What's your okay so the, so my opinion on, on 1080p um, I think you're right you know I think it's I was thinking more streaming space okay. and you were thinking more OTT Space. And I guess that you know you've got to look at the so the chart basically said hey 1080p is not going to play that great on older computers, but the chart kind of ignores the adaptive delivery paradigm that says okay well we'll just drop to, to 720p. So I don't really mean that as any kind of indictment against 1080p not playing on those. It's more um, if you're only using a single file, which very few producers are doing, it can't be 1080p. It's just it's not it's another data point, and I'm. You know, I don't produce a lot of video at 1080p because I do mostly streaming, and I don't, you know, there's a lot of screens out there that can't even handle 1920 by 1080. You know, this, this screen does it poorly. You know, so I think 720p is more useful than 1080p, but, you know, that's, that's every producer's different. And if you're looking at smart TV, 1080p is critical. So, and you're delivering it within an adaptive environment where um, if it doesn't play, it's going to just drop down to 720p anyway. Am I allowed to make one other comment? Yes. Um, I really like the <laughs> but, but, yeah. in terms of the uh, percentage figures, MPEG always quote a target goal figure, and I'm delighted to see people be more realistic in terms of talking about uh, what the potential for the standard can achieve. And I think when uh, encoder vendors uh, provide documentation, you've got to uh, go really deep in terms of understanding what encoders have said they're doing. And often when they're quoting the headline figure of what they believe is possible, typically on a file-based encoder that's you know, 20, 30 times real time running the configure tool set to actually say, we believe there's the potential in the standard to fit this thing. So you've always got to qualify where you are on file-based or live, uh, the amount of resource that you, you've got to throw at it. And one thing that I think hasn't been made clear is that sure, you can actually scale up encoders, but there are certain bottlenecks in the encoding Good, good comments. You know, to kind of summarize for the <laughs> people not in the room, um, you know, you, you do have to, you, people doing these VOD comparisons, you know, you really do need to focus on encoding time. Are they, you know, is it 20 to 1 or is it, you know, 5 to 1? And then on the live side, you're right. It's not, you, you know, you can't just throw resources and get the throughput if, in some instances. But, it, you know, the other side of that is, you know, I, Elemental and all the companies that were listed, I guess Elemental, NEC, and ATEM are actually demonstrating this stuff live, 4K, 60P. So, but then, you know, it, it's, it's really hard. It, then you have the whole quality side. So it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a very simple. HEVC, the headline was 50% data rate reduction, same quality as H.264, just like H.264 was with MPEG-2. We're not there yet. And... It's, it's a very moving target, you know, different for VOD and live, as you pointed out, and different depending on the encoding times you're willing to wait for. Any other questions? Yeah. Did you have any thoughts on compatibility between encoders and decoders, especially in VOD? Because in my, my own experience, taking some 4K HD clips onto Elmel's website, it all, VOD will choke on it, but if you use Elmel's decoder, it plays perfectly fine. 
So any incompatibilities between uh, the encoded clips and the VLC clips? I did not, um, but, but I hear you. I mean, there's not, there's not been a lot of um, intercompatibility testing because, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, DivX is a general purpose consumer player. LML is not going to do a lot of testing on that. VLC is a free player that's kind of a pirate. So, you know, I, I think that's the kind of thing you'll see happening over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, but I don't, I don't think a lot of interchangeability testing has been, has been done to date. On the subject of VLC, are you saying that VLC data breach supports HEDC as of late 2013? Okay, so the question is, am I saying that HEBC can play, I'm sorry, that VLC can play HEBC as of 2013? Yes. So, in fact, the player that I, you know, that I played HEBC content in the VLC player so it, and it was not. I haven't had that experience yet. Really? <laughs> well, go to my website. The content that I have. Okay. We'll go to my website. You know, again, everything we looked at is available on my website for download um, at streaminglearningcenter.com. And you download the, uh, the HEVC files, download um, VLC. And, and again, I was playing those files in the VLC player. Any, and ultra HD content, yeah. you need to plug it yeah. to make it happen. Okay. Um, but I think the vanilla VLC will work, but it's a good oh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, the, that's where the plug in comes. Any other questions? Um, so is the open source HEVC codec going to stimulate wider adoption? I mean, I don't really think so. I mean, I, I don't think it's a bad thing, but I just, I think there's just environmental factors that are just kind of, you know, you've got the bandwidth issues, you've got the licensing issues, you've got the implementation issues, um, you've got the quality comparison. So I see those as, you know, H.264 was open source. I don't, I don't, I don't see that being a huge deal either way. Um, I don't think it's a negative, but I don't think it's going to propel it much faster than the velocity it would have ordinarily. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for your attention.